Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of How to Waste a Lot of Money on an Airplane. Just kidding. Uh, no, I'm really actually not. Uh, so I've been posting a little bit about the troubleshooting issues I've been having with the Rotax and the stumbling idle, um, the vibration, the excessive vibration at about 2800 to 3200 RPM. Seems to be that a lot of you with the Rotax are having these same issues. Um, and according to everything online, it's always pushing the whole, uh, make sure the carburetors are stopped, make sure that you know no jetting was changed, make sure the needle clip is in the right stock position, all these other things. So if we think about like an Edelbrock carburetor that you can go pick up at AutoZone, are you gonna be able to bolt it on your V8 and start your V8? Yes, you will. Does it mean that that carburetor is tuned for how that engine runs? No, it doesn't. Um, so a lot of these people saying, you know, just put it all back to stock, put it back to stock with that blanket statement, that's not actually tuning an engine. That's using a, a published method for a general setting, um, but tuning is required on all carburetors. And just because we have CB carburetors on this, uh, the constant velocity carburetor, and they advertise them that they're self-adjusting depending upon um, the altitude and pressure density and all that fun stuff. Yeah, that, that's great and everything, but at the end of the day, you still have to tune the carburetor to the engine. Um, and then that altitude compensation in the carburetor, sure, is going to be helpful, but you got to tune it first. So the idea that you can just push everything to some single setting and it's going to work on every engine produced, that's not the case. Um, I would like to tinker around with this a little bit more on a couple of 912s that are fully stock and see what the numbers are actually reading um, relative to what I'm reading with all my adjustments. So to give you guys a little breakdown of what I did to this engine uh, in an effort to kind of tune out all those problems and I mean I just landed, got back from flying and I didn't miss a beat. I actually gained uh, another 150 RPMs without even repitching the prop just by actually paying attention to the air fuel mixture and adjusting that air fuel mixture to where it's sitting in that proper balance of uh, basically 12.8 to 1 to 13.1 to 1. Um, so I'll give you guys a quick rundown of what I did. Um, again, I would, I'd be very interested in seeing some of the data you guys collect for anyone that does go about and try this. And I would like to uh, put this out there now that I am not saying that you put all the adjustments that I did uh, into your engine and your engine is going to run perfectly. What I am saying is that you need to tune your engine and your carburetors to each other um, and this is the method in which I went about it. Um, so again, no more blanket statements, no blanket statements will ever come from me. Um, this is how I tuned. I hope you guys uh, can use this information to tune yours and maybe we'll have a couple more 912s out there that are uh, running without these really weird vibrations at halfway throttle. Um, so you can probably see the first thing that you'll notice is that my exhaust is modified. There is actually an O2 sensor bung welded in. Uh, I welded this bung in. It took me shoot, maybe an hour to get it home, clean it up, cut the hole, and weld it all back together. Um, once I did that, you'll also notice it's centrally placed. You don't want to put a weld bung right here or any actually basically 18 inches into this tube is the, the closest point that you want to do that because you start getting out here the likelihood that exterior air is actually mixing is pretty high and so you're not going to get a true reading. So I went ahead and split it dead in the center of the two cylinders or excuse me of the two uh, forward pipes so it's dead between all four cylinders um, and I felt this would be the best place to gather um, applicable data as far as the general status of the engine while it's running. Um, so with that, I then started playing with the idle circuit first. So the idle circuit is gonna be compiled of your idle jet and your idle air screw, which is this little fellow right here. Um, my idle jet is still stock. I did clean it out with some uh, copper wire just to make sure that the bore of that jet wasn't clogged up with any corrosion or gunk. Um, stock jet, and then you are always told to take this screw uh, to one and a half turns out from fully seated. Well, with the air fuel gauge uh, running and this at one and a half turns out from fully seated, if I remember correctly, this engine was running at about 7.9 to 8.3 to one, which is unbelievably rich. That would explain a lot of the stumbling that you guys are seeing at that low 
uh, that low RPM and explain a lot of the vibration that you're seeing as well. Uh, so came back and played with these screws. I am currently sitting at five eighths of a rotation out from uh, fully seated and I am idling at 12.8 to 13.0. Uh, so dead on where we want to be as far as our air fuel mixture goes. So that was our first little thing, getting through the idle. Second thing you're gonna go through is now, as you start increasing your RPM and you start playing in that 2800 to 3200 RPM range that we all seem to get that stumble or that really, really weird vibration at, that's gonna start playing with the uh, needle jet and the needle itself. Uh, the needle jet, so now we're talking about the mid band of the carburetor. Um, so with the needle jet, the needle on these is typically set to the third position from the top of the needle, um, third click position from the top of the needle. Uh, this carburetor I had to open up and set it to the second uh, position. The first position was causing a very lean condition, or excuse me, a very rich condition at um, about that 30, or excuse me, that 28 to 3200 RPM range. Um, we had quite a, a rich condition there at 32 to 2800 RPMs. And that rich condition, again, is likely causing that stumble, that big vibration that you're feeling. Because um, you're just not efficiently combusting all of the, the fuel that's being delivered to your cylinders. Uh, it's not a good thing. Um, okay, so play with the needle. I got the needle into the second click position. That's actually suggested from what I'm reading um, for higher altitude. And since I'm operating out of Reno Stead, uh, we are sitting at 5,050 MSL, um, just sitting right here on the ground. So I am at a higher altitude. So um, the, the position of the clip is the same position that's suggested for that higher altitude change. With the needle having the clip in the second position, um, we were able to get this thing to run in the 11.8 to 12.1 ish um, region in the air fuel mixture for the mid band. That is still rich, however, I'm not really wanting to mess with it outside of that since it is close to our ideal value of 12.8 and we spend so little time in the mid range of these engines. It basically, you know, during power, like pulling power out for your base to final. Um, so when you're, you're sitting in that, that small range, running a little bit rich isn't going to hurt, but running at, you know, 8.4, which was initially what this was running at with the clip in the third position, that's excessive. Um, so I'm not really going to mess with the mid range on this anymore to try and get it to that 12.8 number. Again, we don't spend enough time in that mid range to really worry about it. And as long as I'm running rich, I'd rather be a little rich than lean. So left that alone. Then we start pushing into the wide open throttle. At wide open throttle, the main circuit in the carburetor is going to be your main circuit, uh, your, your main jet. When you play with your wide open throttle, there's only really so much you can do as far as adjustments go on that for the fact that um, the main jet is actually gonna be the limiting factor because your main jet is directly below your needle jet and your needle jet will be larger than your main jet. So when that needle is completely out of the way or it, it's lifted far enough to be letting fuel through the, the needle jet side of that, um, the orifice in your main jet being slightly smaller will actually be the, uh, the orifice that dictates how much fuel is delivered. So with that said, um, you can basically wide open throttle and again using the air fuel mixture you can see that with the 158 main jet I was actually sitting right about 13.4, uh, 13.5 to 1 so it's a little lean, it's close but still lean. Uh, lean conditions destroy things. So uh, I took that 158 main jet out and a 159 main jet in and now I am currently either, excuse me, not either, um, with a 159 main jet in, I am now running at about 12.5, 12.6 to one at wide open throttle, uh, which is okay. Uh, again, it's a little on the rich side, but I'd rather have that extra two points of uh, fuel in during wide open throttle to help keep these cylinders a little bit more cool. Um, so then pulling back to cruise with the 159 main jet, uh, we get dead on 12.8. Uh, so yeah, that's it. The 
last big thing that I seem to be reading a lot of you guys are having problems with is the uh, fuel tubes or fuel overflowing out of these tubes. Um, the recommendation we always read for these uh, the float bowl uh, settings, wow, the recommendations that are online in regards to uh, the float level height is basically the armature inside of this is to be measured relative to this surface right out here and the point at which the armature, the bottom of that armature rests relative to the surface is advertised or is stated to be uh, 10.5 millimeters. That's not the case in this. If I put that at 10.5 millimeters, I have fuel pouring out of both tubes on both sides, excessive vibration, you know, the works. Um, you're basically making an excessive rich condition in your engine with all that extra fuel coming through. So the way that I found around that was to, uh, you know, leave your fuel on while we're sitting here talking. Fuel's on, um, gravity feed, pressure into this thing so that now we have the fuel height in these bowls that we should have while we're basically at operation, right? Shut your fuel off, crack these, I put a rag or something over your exhaust if it's hot. Crack these bowls off, pull them off, set them on a flat surface, and this lower cap right here should allow it to be basically planar with that flat surface. And take a measurement of the height of the fuel in the bowl relative to the top of the bowl. What I've found is that on both of these carburetors, if I set that height to 12.5 millimeters, I have zero fuel coming out. Um, that, that was a great one. I can pop these, uh, like I said, I just got done flying. I can pop these carburetors off, wipe my finger on the inside, and I have no residual fuel stuck to the inside of these intakes either, which was a big problem before with all that excessive vibration and overflowing. Um, so yeah, that is really what I've done to this. I would, again, love for a couple of y'all to do this as well and, and kind of give me a little bit of feedback about what happened to your engine. Where is it sitting with all those uh, stock numbers? Mine was unbelievably rich, and that unbelievably rich explains a lot. So please, you know, I take this time, uh, go over the video again if you need to, send me any questions, comments, uh, whatever you need. The, there's a thread up about this plane and the trials and tribulations that I've gone through fighting this engine uh, for months now on uh, backcountrypilot.org as well as uh, Team Kitbox. So please check out the threads on there. Uh, you can add us on Instagram at abdes.llc. I tend to post uh, in real time at least a couple updates a day if you guys want to see what's going on with the plane. Uh, and yeah, I really hope this helps at least one of you. And I look forward to talking to you all. And those of you that are going to be at High Sierra Flying 2022 or the Kit Fox Factory Tour, um, I'll see you guys there. Thank you again for all your time. Please, you know, participate in this. Give me some feedback. Again, I'm not saying that this is the way to do it. I am simply saying that, uh, you know, this is what I did. So feedback is always welcome. Uh, as long as it's constructive, don't be an asshole. Uh, thank you guys for paying attention, and I look forward to talking to you guys soon. Like and subscribe. Thank you.